Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Southwest Wings 30th Anniversary Virtual Speaker Series Festival. I'm Mary Sia. And I'm Chris Harper. We're really glad you can join us today. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we will be um, saving questions for the end and to please put them in the question and answers box um, uh, 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 in, on your screen rather than the chat box. Thank you for uh, helping us with that. And we're very pleased today to be able to welcome Glenn Maynooth, who's spoken to us before. Today he's going to be talking about volcanoes and he's going to reveal that we actually have volcanoes here in Cochise County, which I had no idea about. So I'm looking forward to finding out all about it. So without further ado, over to you, Glenn. Hey, Glenn. Hi. Hey, good morning. Good Welcome. morning, everyone. I'm still trying to uh, get, share my screen, apparently. Here we go. I just wanted to remind you that uh, in addition to this lecture, which is on volcanoes, we have a field trip planned tomorrow morning, half day from 8 to 12. We'll meet up at the old Outback Steakhouse parking lot and then journey over toward the Mule Mountains and look at uh, the limestone rocks, some of the older rocks, and I will show you the oldest rocks that we have in the state of Arizona, uh, equivalent to the oldest rocks at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So we'll do that tomorrow morning. You're welcome to join us if you like me a, a little before eight, so we can leave on time. So today's subject is, is volcanoes, and before you is the deepest lake in North America residing in uh, an ancient volcano, an ancient super volcano that was quite large. And I'll be talking more about the Crater Lake. So what I wanted to do first was to show you where we're going today by defining what a volcano is and then introducing you to uh, something you may have heard of before and that's plate tectonics theory, some volcanic features, characteristics of volcanoes, how we classify them. And then uh, some of my favorite topics are large volcanoes called calderas and then they're uh, associated pyroclastic flows. I'll be defining what those are and show you some pictures of those. And then we'll talk about the, the serious volcanoes of the world called the decade volcanoes and some of the effects of volcanoes and then uh, how we classify the actual rocks that come from volcanoes. And then lastly, I'll talk about examples of uh, volcanism in Arizona and particularly zoom down into Cochise County and into your backyard in the Huachuca Mountains. Maybe you didn't realize we've had volcanoes in the Huachucas. So the term volcanoes is derived from the name of an island in the Aeolian uh, islands of Italy. So that's off the north coast of Sicily. You see Sicily off an island off the uh, toe of the Buddha Italy. And then north of uh, Palermo is going to be the island of Volcano. And the study of volcanoes as a subdiscipline of geology is called volcanology. So if that's what you do, you're termed a volcanologist, that type of geologist. And they study eruptive activity in the formation and life cycle of volcanoes. And they look at active volcanoes that are currently erupting and they also study more prominently historic eruptions. Mm -hmm. So they have to visit volcanoes, the geologists, especially the active ones, not only to observe, but to collect samples and those samples are usually chunks of lava uh, called tephra or ash or pumice that are blasted out. Our major, well, our one major focus is the prediction of eruptions. Like you wanna predict earthquakes? No can do at this time. In uh, geology, you can't really predict the volcanic eruptions. We, we do know when there are some signals impen of impending eruption, but to predict something, whether it be an earthquake, a volcano or the weather, you have to say where, when, and how much, you know, how big an eruption or how big an earthquake or how big a hurricane it will be. Better with hurricanes than we are with, with volcanoes. So there have been many traditional beliefs about volcanoes. And just mentioning that uh, the Greeks were ones that commented on the power and they could only be explained by the acts of God while in the 16th and 17th century, the German Astronomer Johannes Kepler, he thought there were ducts of uh, energy coming from 
inside the earth, which he called tears. He didn't use the word energy, but something was venting, in other words. And then we've had other people that witnessed volcanic eruptions like Mount Etna and Stromboli, a Jesuit, and he revisited uh, Vesuvius over a period of time and published his view on the earth. And he talked about a central fire connected beneath the earth to numerous others caused by the burning of sulfur and bitumen and coal. And then we go on to realize uh, in more modern times that we can connect the volcanic eruptions to the Earth's mantle. That's the area of a semi-solar material below the Earth's crust. And so it took decades for the idea of uh, compression of the Earth's crust and radioactive materials way down below, miles below, creating the heat to source the volcano's energy. But uh, there have been times when it's still often attributed the cause of volcanoes to chemical reactions and a thin layer of molten rock just below the Earth's crust that's ready to erupt at any time. So the common perception of volcano is a, a conical mountain spewing lava, maybe poisonous gases from the crater and the craters perceived to be at the summit. But that just describes one of many types of volcanoes. So there's features of volcanoes that are a lot more complicated and their structure and behavior can be contingent upon a number of factors. So some volcanoes certainly do have rugged peaks formed by lava domes rather than just a single crater. Others have massive plateaus uh, instead of a crater at the top. So their massive plateaus go on for miles. And then there's some that do issue volcanic material including lava, ash, and certain gases. And the gases are mainly steam and then other uh, chemical gases that we'll be talking about. And they can be, these big volcanoes can also spawn off what are called parasitic volcanoes, small cones off their side. And then if you think beyond Earth, if you think to the planets, we have already discovered by remote sensing, uh, telescopes or satellites orbiting these planets, uh, cryovolcanoes, the case of ice volcanoes on Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune. And cryo means cold. So this isn't really carbon dioxide that's, that's being vented out from below, not magma, hot, no hot magma at this point. And then there's mud volcanoes that are associated uh, with um, not any type of magmatic activity directly. So they involve hot temperatures, but lower than those of what it takes to form igneous rocks. So the plate tectonics theory that explains why volcanoes occur in most cases, but not all, uh, is evidenced here by a couple different diagrams that correspond to the chart. So the crust of the Earth is divided up conventionally now. Most people believe there's about 17 large crustal plates varying in thickness from 6 to 30 miles, depending whether they're in the ocean or on the continent. And if you look at the three types of uh, intersections, that is the side of the plates where it hits another plate, joins another plate, you can have divergent, as we see in this picture, so there's material being accreted, volcanic material, as you can see in the cross section, coming up from the mantle and adding material to the ocean seafloor. These occur on the ocean seafloor. So this is a spreading center contrasted to a convergent area. We just came from a divergent example where crust is being added and going both directions. Look at here, the arrows are reversed. Two plates are coming against each other and one subducting under the other, the heavier plate is the ocean plate coming under the crustal plate and down in this area, magma is generated and uh, mixed with the two different types of plate material. And then volcanoes, as you see, these puffs of uh, ash coming up. Example would be the Andes Mountains or the, the Cascade Mountains. And then sometimes we have transform activity, which simply means there's no subduction or there's no divergence of the plates, but they are grinding past each other. And there's no major uh, effect of, uh, for volcanics with most of those intersections. So I wanted to show you where some of these plates are. The boundaries are usually uh, in convergent zones or subduction zones surrounding uh, huge plates like the Pacific Ocean here is a huge plate and around it is the circumscribed Pacific Ring of Fire. And you can see all these volcanoes like off the Aleutian chain or if you go over here, you can see them along the Cascadian uh, side of uh, Oregon and Washington and down into the Sierra Nevada. Even better examples coming from Kamchatka Peninsula down in an arc, an island arc, 
to Japan, another island arc, and, and so on. So the red lines are different from the red dots. Now, the red offset lines that are somewhat jagged here, very well offset down here to see, would be the mid-ocean ridges. So there's certainly the classic example that extends from Iceland all the way down to mid-Atlantic, hence mid-ocean ridge, all the way down into the southern Atlantic Ocean. But there's one here called the East Pacific Rise coming from Antarctica Ridge. And the East Pacific Rise eventually approaches the North American plate where it comes up through the Gulf of California and expresses itself in our North American continent in California as the San Andreas Fault running right up through uh, the Western part of California. So I covered uh, several of the occurrences there except one. And that's one that doesn't relate to plate tectonics. And that's the volcanoes out in the middle of the continents. Look at these. No particular reason to link these to plate tectonics theory. And you see them all over Asia too. Just these little dots coming up. Uh, what explains those? So we have to move on to, to look at that. Here's a cross section then of a, a cartoon that shows a, in a magnified sense the Earth's basalt plates ocean plates that are plunging down under the uh, lighter, less dense continental plate. So this is a subduction zone. This is the area right in the bottom center where the two come together, grind together. It's deep enough, 200 miles down where the crust melts the two types and puts up an intermediate lava called andesite through the volcanic conduit. So hence the Andes, Andes Mountains. That's where the rock andesite comes from. Let's look at a divergent boundary. There's still volcanic rock coming up. And as you can see, it comes from a magma source. It just goes in both direction when it hits the bottom of the oceans, the seafloor. It spreads in two directions. That's what we're seeing, a, a slight ridge here. And because we're adding material, the area is in tension. There's a block, usually a rift zone that drops down. So this is an area of some shallow earthquakes, fissure valleys. And not only do we have them, along the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but also as an example, the East African Rift comes right down through the continent of Africa. So over here, here are some volcanics occurring. This is uh, the seafloor, and you can see different bands of colors of gray in the center of the youngest rocks. And these volcanoes uh, are older as you get out away from this ridge that would be right down the center. So these are seamounts when they're not surface, uh, like the Hawaiian Islands penetrate the surface into the atmosphere. These are volcanoes that are subsurface. We just call them seamounts. And then we see this idea of hotspots. Now, hotspots can happen on the inside of an interior of a continent, or they can happen out in the ocean, the middle of the plate. Again, uh, not everybody agrees to why they happen, but the idea is the hotspot would be a, an area that's a fixed place. It doesn't move then. But the crust above them, on, or the plates above them, do move and migrate. So the example that's classic, of course, is the Hawaiian Islands, where you see oldest volcanoes like Kauai, and then Oahu, and, and Maui heading toward the youngest volcanoes. Here's a different rendition of it over here. Uh, the oldest volcanoes, see the plate motion is this way. So the plate's moving over this Hawaiian hotspot. Kauai is there. Uh, no one really knows what the characteristic that makes it be a hot spot, but it is there and the crust as it moves over creates volcanoes. So the current volcano would be the island of Hawaii that's active. And we have old volcanoes on the end of the chain that are now below the sea level called seamounts. The decade volcanoes, that doesn't mean they erupt every 10 years, but what it does mean in the 1990s, a UN sponsored team uh, internationally, uh, internationally uh, assembled a group of people in association with uh, a group of uh, volcanologists and chemists. And they looked at the interior of the earth, you know, from the, the surface and what was going on with volcanoes worthy of a particular interest and they found that the history of large destructive eruptions and their proximity to populace is what was of concern uh, if they were going to do anything for identifying earth's hazards so they identified 17 decade volcanoes this took a decade to do this un study that's why it's called the decade 
volcanoes. So these 17 are listed here. I won't go through them all, but other than to name some that you have heard of before, like Vesuvius, Mount Unzen in Japan, a frequent eruptor, Mount, Rear, Mount Rainier in Washington, a potential eruptor that can influence uh, the destruction of uh, parts of Seattle even. And then Galeros eruptin in our lifetime, along with Mauna Loa and others in Indonesia, Africa. So through historical time, I want to talk about active volcanoes. And to call a volcano active, uh, we turn to the International Association of Volcanology, and they use a definition by which uh, they can identify 500 active volcanoes. That means in the realm of recorded history, there's rec records that have documented the, uh, through the span of time in various regions that date back, for instance, in China and Mediterranean, if you're type talking active volcanoes, that's 3,000 years, whereas if it's the Pacific Northwest or United States, including Canada, you reach back only 300 years to define active volcanoes, that's in the Cascades, or in Hawaii and New Zealand for active volcanoes, a 200-year uh, active history. So Kilauea volcano on the island of Hawaii, the big island, has been in continuous or effusive. Effusive means pouring out lava, steady flows onto the ground since 1883. And it also has the distinction of having the longest observed lava lake. Mount Etna and nearby Stromboli, those are two different Mediterranean volcanoes, are, have been almost in continuous eruption through much of my life. And out in the uh, Pacific, out toward or northeast of New Zealand is Vanuatu. Vanuatu has been erupting nearly continuously for over 800 years. As of August 2015, these are some of the uh, longest ongoing, but not necessarily continuous volcanic eruptive phases. So we see things like Stromboli again, Mount Etna and uh, Mount Yasser in Vanuatu. Vanuatu. And these two down here uh, in Guatemala and Ecuador, you may not have heard of them, but what they all have in common is uh, they've been going active now for about 100 years. Now, what's a dormant volcano? That's much harder to judge. Uh, and then there's dormant volcanoes that we thought were dormant that are reactivated. So we have to go on volcanoes uh, being extinct if there's no written record of their activity. But there are some examples of uh, uh, dating of rocks that we can see that they went back way before the beginning of uh, recorded history. For instance, at Yellowstone, you go back 700,000 years for the start of the eruptions and uh, Toba volcano, 380,000 years. Now, the Roman writers described the Vesuvius eruptions around 79 in the Common Era. And of course, that particular volcano destroyed the towns of Pompeii, which you've heard of, and also one nearby one in Herculaneum. And then you come to more current times, probably in your lifetime, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines was an inconspicuous volcano unknown by most people that lived in that area. And in 1991, it did erupt. There's two other current examples. Uh, the Sufrié Hills on the island of Montserrat was thought to be extinct until 1995 in four peaked mountain in Alaska erupted in 2006, and it hadn't erupted before that since 8,000 BC. Now, what are extinct volcanoes? Those are what consider, or scientists consider that they're uh, unlikely to erupt again because they don't have a magma supply. Their plumbing is kind of devoid of any fluids. So, so here's some examples of extinct volcanoes. The one closest to us is Shiprock, New Mexico, up at right at the Four Corners area. All you can see are the innards left of the volcano, the inside plumbing that's solidified, and then a few others that are listed, like the Explorer Seamount chain north of Hawaii. Edinburgh Castle in Scotland is uh, located atop an extinct volcano, so there's another example. Otherwise, these are hard to determine so there can be these super volcano calderas that have erupted with lifespans that are measured in millions of years. I'll show you a few examples of those. So the term extinct is now uh, replaced 
uh, actually we we call them inactive volcanoes so uh, some people refer to them as extinct that's what i'll say about that and then uh, the effects of volcanoes on on mankind is what we're talking about so there can be steam generated eruption where's the steam come from well not only the magma but more importantly the groundwater and i'll show you one uh, over in southeast cochise county that comes from that situation and then in explosive eruptions that have the mineral silica in them in a high concentration that uh, makes the lava called rhyolite. And then there's effusive or eruptions that flow very easily because they have low silica content. The mineral silica is not as high as it is in uh, the rhyolite. We call those basalts, a lava rock you've heard of before. And then pyroclastic flows, pyro is fire, clastic is broken. So these are fire broken rocks or lava. And we'll see some examples of those. Those things are deadly. And lahars are uh, debris flows or volcanic mud flow. Sometimes uh, glaciers on a mountain can melt and that adds to the water coming down the mountain. Carbon dioxide emissions and other gases that are harmful like sulfur dioxide, which is poisonous, can come out of volcanoes and pose a threat to humans and their activities. So when I went to school back in the 70s in college in uh, geology, these, this is the classification that we use from McDonald to look at all the different types of volcanoes down this left column. And most of them have a, a geographic name or the name of a particular mountain like Pele, Mount Pele in uh, the Caribbean. That's a particular volcano, but it has a style of eruption. And then you can look at the nature of the magma. At one end, the basalts are very fluid, but on the other, and there's uh, very viscous magmas don't flow. In fact, they like to plug up the vents of the volcano, which creates explosions. And then there's some that have actually no magma involved, but they still erupt. And these are some examples down here. And then you can look at other types of uh, qualities of each of these volcanoes, uh, the lava quality, uh, what they put out in terms of uh, volcanic bombs and uh, glass as in volcanic glass. Glass simply is meaning there are no crystal structures. It's magma that cooled so fast, it formed glass. It didn't form small crystals. And then the structures that they build, they all have names. So if you look into this, you would be coming aware of many of the characteristics of volcanoes on ch from charts like this. The other thing is to look at the explosive character or eruptive characteristics and Although you can qualify them by small, moderate, large, and so forth, that doesn't tell you much until you start looking at the volume of volcanic products that come out of the vent called tephra. Tephra can talk about lava, uh, not only lava, but ash, dust, blocks, and volcanic bombs, that sort of product. Uh, that, that's all an expression of the amount of energy. So the bigger the volcano, the more volume of tephra. These are the large volcanoes on this end. And that means with a lot of energy, you can propel above sea level, the volcanic cloud to greater heights, which means if it goes up into the stratosphere, it has big implications for climate. So these are some of the other descriptive terms from the other chart, the types of eruptions here. And then they have different durations. Not all volcanoes have to erupt on a schedule. And at the very bottom, this is, uh, called tropospheric injection or stratospheric injection. Those are just two different layers of the atmosphere. The stratosphere is the next layer above our troposphere where our weather uh, performs in the atmosphere. So some of these volcanoes will shoot volcanic dust and products, chemicals into the stratosphere, which has implications on the Earth's temperature for a number of years afterwards. So if you want to look at the eruption styles and put a little diagram by it, um, these are some of the types of shapes that you get with the various volcanoes. Now, some of them here in this cartoon look very similar, but they, they have uh, uh, descriptions that visually are different. See, this is a very steep-sided volcano compared to the basalt volcanoes like up in Iceland. So these are more basaltic light on this end and then more andesitic. And if you come off the end of this chart where there's no room to put the rest of it, you have to come down to to this part, pick up the andesite lavas and see that the, uh, the lavas convert to rhyolite, very stiff. And notice there's bigger clouds because these plug up the vents and they cause them to explode with their thick pasty lavas. And they put out a lot of 
a lot of pyroclastic fragments, a lot of material being ejected. So here's one um, that's a special kind of volcano. A caldera, by definition, is any volcano with a volcanic vent greater than one mile in diameter. And they can range up to 20 miles in diameter, 40 miles in diameter. So these are the huge super volcanoes that put out all types of uh, material. Now, sometimes they won't appear like Crater Lake. Before you is the evolution in these three different artistic impressions of Crater Lake volcano. And you see this, uh, the biggest picture here has a distinct crater. It's, oh, greater than five miles across on the average. But just think if that mountain got eroded down, all you'd have is the volcanic bedrock. And that is what we call the exhumation, or we'll say that the caldera is exhumed by erosion. So there's absolutely no physical rim expression at the surface that you could see from an airplane or if you went hiking in an exhumed volcano. So we don't call those calderas, they're called cauldrons. And we happen to have a lot of cauldrons in Arizona. You don't see a lot of features like Crater Lake in Arizona that we don't have them, but we have the calderas. And I'll show you how we know they are there even though they're not expressed topographically. So you notice Mount, ancient Mount Mazama that erupted 7,700 years ago was covered by snow. It stuck up or around the uh, ancient Cascadian mountains and had glaciers flowing down the side and then uh, turned in to be a, what's called a caldera. And over here, we can see the nature of a caldera. The caldera erupts a lot of ash and a lot of pumice, but it starts out with a bulging of the Earth's crust because the magma inflates the Earth's crust, this big chamber of magma. And it starts allowing faults to occur around the ring of what's going to become the rim. And that weakness allows magma to come up all the way around the ring. And then at some point, all this magma, or at least a major portion of it, is uh, run out. You run out of the, the water supply, in this case, the magma supply. And what happens? The roof of the crust can no longer be supported and it drops down intact. In other words, this isn't blowing out five miles across or 40 miles across. It just falls down and sinks. And when it does, we have these great eruptions. And then eventually what they're showing here is uh, these are areas that are interiorly drained uh, from the local hydrology. All the water flows in from snow or, or ice from glaciers if they're high enough or just rainwater as it would be in Crater Lake. It maintains its lake height. So a few more views of Crater Lake as we look at a wide angle view in the upper left. But the center areas here show you the ancient profile of Mount Mazama compared to Crater Lake today. Or if you like to look at it from a distance with an actual photo, you see the surface of the lake drawn in here behind, in front of the mountains that contain it, and then the height that blew off or actually uh, sank down. A lot of this material was removed, but remember a lot of this crust of the volcano just went straight down. Then there was re-eruptions in the form of a cinder cone, different structure of lava, uh, basalt cinder cones, Wizard Island shown here on the map down in the lower left. So Crater Lake is known for uh, putting out a lot of ash in the Northwest. And you see the circle up here, the ellipse, showing you the general coverage of, uh, you know, hundreds of cubic miles of ash, volcanic ash that came out of Mount Mazama 7,700 years ago. One cubic kilometer came out of Mount St. Helens. This was the ash pattern just by comparison. So surveys had been done in Crater Lake, bathymetric or underwater surveys, they're called. Uh, and they've found lava domes besides Wizard Island that sticks up as a cinder cone in the area through the lake surface. There's another cone called uh, Miriam Cone and a landslide even noted on this side. Because of the steep walled caldera, there are often landslides down the wall. Here's some uh, comparisons for large calderas, much bigger than Crater Lake. We're talking 40 miles, maybe in diameter on the long dimension. You don't have to have a circular rim like say Crater Lake. This is the Yellowstone caldera and it has a history 
as operating not on a plate boundary, a plate tectonics identified boundary. It's out in the middle of the continent, in the middle of the US in Wyoming. It's a hotspot volcano. And as I've shown you here with this dashed arrow that I put in, the crust that you see, all the gray area in the map, the Earth's crust is moving in this direction, the North American plate. And under this area right here is a hot spot. Well, there was a part of the Earth's crust that used to be up in this area, but it's moved on in the same direction as the arrow that I put there. So this is the Island Park volcano, which was another big caldera. And there's more calderas off to the Southwest. And they've all been moving over the hot spot. So right now, the Yellowstone area remains over the hot spot. If you look at the Yellowstone historic or prehistoric eruptions, you'll see three different zones of uh, ash that were distrib distributed all over the central and western US. So there's the Mesa Falls ash bed that erupted at a different time than this Huckleberry Ridge ash bed that covers this much of the United States. And of course, the biggest one is the Lava Creek eruption that covered this big round, uh, rounded triangle, the points, the apices are rounded. Look at that in contrast to the Long Valley Caldera over by uh, Mono Lake, California, east of Yosemite. Right in this area at the Arrowhead is where Long Valley Caldera is. It put out the Bishop Tuff, which had a big distribution pattern uh, with these black dots. So let's move on to pyrocrastic flows. Volcanic eruptions can produce uh, broken fire magma rocks, pyroclasts that are exploded out of the volcano. They can go up and then collapse and come back down in a collapse cloud and come down the flanks of the volcano or the volcano itself can blow out to the side. So we're looking at several different flows here. Um, if you look at this center one, this is Mount Anjin in 1991 in Japan. Uh, certainly they were photographing pyroclastic flows that were going um, more or less in another canyon off the screen, but it is the case of pyroclastic flows that they can jump canyons and jump ridges unexpectedly. That's what happened here, and it's headed right for this village, and it hit part of this village. 41 people died. These people are fleeing for their lives. This van here will pass this man who's screaming with his hands over his head and running away from this pyroclastic flow. They can uh, move at minimum, say, 50 miles an hour. Some have been clocked at 200 miles an hour, so you're not going to outdrive them. Here's one at Mount Pinatubo. This van is fleeing a pyroclastic flow. These are the results of these pyroclastic flows. They are called in the old days when I went to school, a French term by a French term called Noé Ardense or glowing avalanches, Noé Ardense. And this is what happened to the island of Martinique and the city of St. Pierre, one of the islands down there in the Caribbean. And we see that 30,000 people lived in what was called the Paris of the Caribbean. And in 30 seconds, the city was destroyed by a pyroclastic flow. So here's one coming down a mountainside in the lower right. And these flows have different characteristics. Uh, at the very bottom of the flow, we see that the turbulence is suppressed. These are hard to research because you can't walk into them and take samples, of course. You only have to look at the uh, results of the flow and then uh, dig into it afterwards. And after it cools, they'll, they'll stay hot for months. These things can melt glass, melt silverware, and burn humans, uh, incinerate them. Above the turbulent area that's being suppressed, there's a maximum turbulence higher up in the pyroclastic flow. So you want to escape these, and you probably can't if one's bearing down on you. The temperatures are up to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit and they can flow at, at very high speeds. Pyroclastic flows. Here's some more examples. Uh, they'll take buildings and bend the rebar that's in them, no problem. Humans are taken down very quickly. Their eyes are, for instance, vaporized. Here's this man running. The van didn't stop to pick him up, by the way. In the US, the Western US, these are some of the volcanoes that have uh, been classed on this diagram as quaternary. That's a period in geological time occupying in the time scale the last 
million years before present. So I want you to see that a lot of these uh, volcanoes or basalt fields, that's what we're calling them in the title of this is basalt volcanoes. So it leaves out a lot of other styles of volcanic eruption like the calderas and so forth. These are just volc basaltic volcanic volcanoes. So they're well distributed beyond the Cascade and Sierra Nevada mountain range, just and you see they come out into this area of the US, including down here, a field I'll show you, the Geronimo Field, or we know it as the San Bernardino Valley in southeastern Ch Cochise County. There are volcanic gases that come out that vary considerably between volcanoes. So one volcano's gas is different than any others. Those can be measured by a geologist who put sensors or fly helicopters through the uh, gas clouds. And they're principally, believe it or not, water vapor followed by, uh, in most abundance, uh, carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. But there's other chemicals like hydrogen fluoride and hydrogen chloride and carbon monoxide, volatile metal chlorides, organic compounds, and helicarbons. So that's a collection of a lot of uh, materials that come out as, as gas, and they can be injected into the atmosphere and one of the problems is that when you take sulfur dioxide and put it into particular our upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, up above 35 miles in middle latitudes, it becomes sulfuric acid as it mixes. And it condenses in the stratosphere to, find, to form very fine aerosols. And those types of aerosols are what create reflections of the Earth's or the sun's energy coming back. So it reflects radiation back that's coming in from the sun. And so we end up cooling the earth down during volcanic eruptions rather than heating it up, might be counterintuitive. But on the other hand, you can uh, absorb heat radiated up from the earth in these clouds and then, then you can actually warm the stratosphere. That's the same part of the atmosphere way up that's reflecting the sun. Overall, things cool down and they have created famines like the one I show, the Russian famine of 1601 through 1603 with the eruption of a single volcano. Uh, folks have, geologists have suggested that certain volcanoes have done a lot of killings uh, to humans and not only humans, but the, the animals on the earth. So some of the big volcanic activities that have occurred have occurred at the end of geologic periods like the end of the Ordovician, the end of the Permian at the Triassic boundary, and then in the late Devonian. These are all times of mass distinctions not caused directly by uh, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide from tailpipes because we didn't have cars back 600 million years ago, but they were caused by volcanic gases, volcanic products that went high up. And then massive events like the Siberian traps, uh, traps or uh, volcanic eruptions that have huge lava flows. You probably heard the Columbia basalts by the Columbia River. That's another example of traps, the word traps for volcanic flows on a mega scale. Uh, they, these events occurred over 500 million years, the Siberian traps. So that's a long time to be spewing material into the atmosphere. And so it contributed likely to the great dying about 250 million years ago, estimated that it killed 90% of the species that, that existed at the time. So I wanna move on to hazards and one particular hazard that you've seen in our lifetime is aviation. And so when these uh, ejecta come out of the volcano, uh, it's the small particles that do the damage. I mean, the pilots don't aim right over the crater to fly to get hit by big volcanic bombs, but they do get uh, pelted by volcanic ash, very small particles that can craze the windows, the plastic uh, windows on the plane, or uh, wreck the engines mainly is what they're concerned about. So the turbine blades get eroded literally or melted particles from the volcano uh, and that heat up in the turbine blades actually melt onto the turbine blades and that's very bad for the jet engines. So Boeing, the jet company, has been exploring that situation. Of course, there's a lot of a grounding of flights anywhere there's a volcano, like in Mount Redoubt when it, in Alaska when it erupted, or in Iceland uh, in 2010 with their eruptions. A lot of European flights 
uh, into the area had to be canceled. So with the advent of these types of activities, nine volcanic ash advisory centers have been established by a UN organization called the IKO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. And they're dedicated to monitoring ash cloud concentrations and advising pilots, all from volcanoes. This is how we classify volcanoes technically. And if you want to do it technically, you go to a microscope and you look at a thin section. A thin section is a slab, a very small slab of rock that can be ground down after it's glued to the microscopic slide and it's ground down so that it's a thin section of what it used to be and it'll transmit light. Then you look at it through the microscope, a special type of microscope that illuminates it. And you can start to see the concentration of these various minerals. And this chart is what every geology student would, would learn probably in geology uh, 101 about the different types of rocks. You heard of uh, rocks at the surface that we see all the time, granite, diorite, and gabbro. Well, they have equivalents of volcanic rocks where you can't see the crystals. They're called aphanitic crystals that you can't see them. They're fine. You need a microscope and sometimes even an electronic microscope to see the very small volcanic crystals. So the lava products that have a lot of silicon and, and thick, pasty lavas because of that silica content, and the silica is expressed as quartz, the mineral quartz here is. That lava is rhyolite, produces explosive eruptions. Kind of at the other end would be rocks that have a lot of ferromagnesium elements like the pyroxenes and olivines. Uh, they create a very heavy type of lava, whereas this one, if you lifted it up, is much lighter in heft than the heft of a basalt sized um, material if you compared two similar sizes, this one, the basalt would be much heavier. So there are ways uh, to do the classification in the lab, or you can use a hand lens and get some appreciation for the types of minerals. And if they fall in one area, then it's gonna be a rhyolite. But if you're seeing peroxide, peroxines and olivines and calcium rich feldspars and some hornblende thrown in, then you'd be talking about a basalt, like a black lava from Hawaii. And notice at the bottom again, let me get back to that slide. Uh, it says the darkness increases to the right because the silica is less in these and specific gravity, that means density increases to the right. So basalts are much heavier as I pointed out than rhyolites. The type of uh, behavior of the lava primarily depends on the resistance to flow. So that means uh, the viscosity is another way of uh, talking about that, that uh, toothpaste consistency has a high viscosity compared to water that flows very easily. So magmas behave the, behave the same way depending how much silica are in them. The slope of the ground determines how fast uh, lava can flow as well as the uh, rate of products coming out of the volcano, the lava production rate. So this amount of silica, uh, because there's not a lot, uh, decreases the resistance of flow and thus Basaltic lava moves very easily over the ground, even over gentle slopes. Over in Hawaii, some of those lava rivers that you've seen streaming will go up to 40 miles an hour because they can uh, move with very little silica concentration in them. Whereas dacite lavas and rhyolite lavas with the amount of silicas in it, they tend to pile up around the vent, plug it up, and their flows are very stubby, very blocky, very steep fronted, and they create mounded domes as opposed to what you'd see from the low volcanoes, low angle volcanoes, say in Hawaii. So here's a way to uh, look at classification, a little different angle, basalt, andesite, dacite, and rhyolite. Those are common lavas. And you see the decreasing of mobility, the decreasing of movement of lava toward the right. So the rhyolites are the ones that are stiff and pasty. And look at that, they have the highest silica, no surprise. And look at the melting temperatures. The salts melt at 1160 degrees, that's centigrade, not Fahrenheit. Whereas rhyolites melt at 900 degrees centigrade. So the amount of energy needed to melt the magma or, or to, to get this, keep this stuff flowing once it's out is very different between the lavas. 
Now, the texture of or the size components of what comes out of a volcano, you may have heard some of these terms like ash or dust uh, in an intermediate size classification. It's lapilli. The biggest things that come out that can be uh, a block size of lava that you could live with both hands to bombs that might be as huge as railroad cars or houses that come out of the volcano because of the energy blasting. So where we get these names is strictly on the size of the components. And they have demarcations that are arbitrary. There's nothing uh, sacred about the sizes that you see here of ash being less than two millimeters. It's just a scientific arbitrary definition. And then we see that they are identified in categories on what's called a ternary diagram or ternary plot. I have two of them here displayed. I want you to know these are really frequent in many science disciplines, whether it be botany or zoology. Whenever you want to compare three different things that have percentages, you can put them on this triangular uh, shape area and then classify. I won't go through the classifications other than to say these are the size classifications over here, as opposed to this other ternary plot over here. This looks at the composition component. What is in that lava? Is it stone fragments, rock fragments from the country rock that got blown out on the side or the vent wall? Those are called lithics. Or is it uh, vitrix, as in volcanic glass? Uh, glass doesn't have any crystals, or is it volcanic crystals themselves? So we classify the lavas in terms of just this quantitative assessment. You can do this by looking at through a hand lens in a very crude way, or you can again take a thin section of lava, put it on a, under a microscope and use counters to count what you're seeing in there uh, in terms of how many crystals there are, how many lithics there are, how much glass is in there. These are ternary plots. You can even take a ternary plot and add an additional variable here by folding the triangle down and I don't want you to be able to read these. I just want you to see how valuable they are. They can be used to compare, for instance, four different uh, characteristics as an example. So we'll leave those volcanic products and look at volcanism more locally in the state of Arizona. And you can do this in different ways. You can look at volcanic fields, which are listed down here just by name. And I put these X's here to remind you that there's no correlation by the names over to these colors. So don't look at the color and think that's the name. The, colors are just identifying similar ages of volcanoes. So if we look at volcanic rocks here across Arizona, they are fairly recent in red from zero to four million years, as opposed to in contrast, if you look at greens and blues, um, the greens for instance down here and blues where we live are uh, 50 to 80 million years if they're green. And I'll show you some examples of those right about a mile away from I live uh, in the Huachuca Mountains. Here are some of the more recent volcanoes where you can see more features of volcanoes in Arizona. So these are quaternary, last 2.58 million years, and tertiary going 65 million years back. So collectively, what you're seeing are two colors, quaternary, very recent, two and a half million years volcanoes, the pink areas, these are volcanic fields like Flagstaff volcanic field. And this is uh, the Springerville volcanic field. Springerville is a town in cent central or east central Arizona. And the Arankarit area up north of the Grand Canyon is pink. And then you look at the gold color, which are quaternary or uh, tertiary volcanics the last 65 million years ago to 2 million. These gold colors are quite dispersed throughout the state, including down here in the White Mountains. This is the White Mountain volcanic field, this gold area here. So these are more fresh terrain because they're only a few million years old. Compared to, for instance, if you went back uh, to 15 or 16 or 25 million years ago in the Superstition Mountains, uh, east of Phoenix, you see here is Apache Junction. You've heard of the Superstition Mountains, some of the tales that have come out of them. Here are a, a distribution of three different calderas of three different ages. So there's, there's the tortilla cauldron and the goldfield cauldron and the superstition cauldron. So these are very wide vents, you know, in terms of miles that erupted a lot of tough or ash 
that went into the surrounding terrain. And you drive through this up the Apache Trail, State Route 88, as you go near Saguaro Lake and on up to Apache Lake. So I'm looking now in the area of Flagstaff. The metro area of Flagstaff is then down in the lower central portion of the photo, just off to the right. Immediately north of it is the Mount Eldon volcano. But what I wanted you to see was the uh, San Francisco peaks. This is where we have the highest altitude of the state uh, elevation, uh, Mount Humphreys, 13,000 plus feet on top of a volcano. Out of Flagstaff, you can take Highway 180 if you're going up to Page, it circles around. Uh, this is still 180 going up through these volcanoes here. These are cinder cones out where Sunset Crater is. But in this area of cinder cones, this is where the Mercury astronauts or the lunar astronauts, uh, Apollo astronauts train to become familiar with volcanic terrains that they might encounter on the moon. So if you uh, ski, you would know that you were skiing on the side of the composite volcano, the San Francisco peaks. You can see the ski runs here and then the beginner runs on Hart Prairie, a very beautiful area of, of Arizona below the ski area that has a few chairlifts down here. Now, if you go toward the Grand Canyon, which is gonna be up this direction off the Northwest corner of the screen, we'll come across another volcano. So what I'm suggesting to you if you uh, hike the inner basin in the composite uh, volcano of the uh, Flagstaff area, that's very pretty in the fall. But if you're driving up to the Grant and Canyon on Highway 180 up in this area, you can intersect uh, the area of Red Mountain for a break, get out of the car and walk into this cinder cone. This is a kind of a radar imagery showing the relief of uh, Red Mountain. So Red Mountain is carved out. You can look what the inside of a cinder cone actually looks like. You can see that it was a good place to go, good place to take a break. It's not too off, off the road. And I want to come down to south, southern Arizona. So in the south uh, of Tucson region, but across the, let's call it southeastern Arizona for the most part. You can see it doesn't go all the way over to the Colorado River. It just goes out a ways. So we catch these huge, volcanoes that have vent diameters mile across. Uh, Pinabanca Lake is centered down in the uh, Pajarita caldera, an old caldera not visible today. So it's a cauldron. How about the copper mines up by Sierra? Sierra has uh, a history of volcanic eruptions. That's why the copper's there. The Santa Rita caldera, and one you don't see that my friend mapped out a geologist for the Arizona Geological Survey, the Mount Fagan caldera near the Rosemont copper mine that's being proposed in this area. Going over to the tombstone areas, the tombstone caldera. You can only see these because the uh, geologists can interpret the rocks to know that there was a caldera there. There's no topographic rim like Crater Lake in this area. There's one at called uh, uh, Dragoon, the Dragoon caldera. And then down where we live, this is the axis of the Huachuca Mountains down here. There's three different calderas and I'll blow them up in a map in a second. But all these calderas are coming out of two different geograph uh, geologic periods. The Cretaceous calderas with this symbol on the map and then the Jurassic cauldrons that you're seeing here on this, with this symbol on this map. So I'm gonna take you now and, and blow this up very shortly and show you what we have in our backyard. So we have, on this geologic map that blows up the Huachucas. And you see it says Huachuca Mountains right here. This is the Southern Huachucas. And we're down in the area right by uh, Coronado National Memorial down by the uh, border country, the international border. So it says Montezuma Pass right here. And I'll be showing you a blow up of this map in color, but I want you to see these three cal cauldrons even though they're called calderas on this slide, originally they were when they erupted, they're put in order of eruption from oldest to youngest. So I'll, I'll point them out. Now they're not full rims, even when they're exhumed or uncovered by erosion. They're partial rims that can be interpreted. So the Montezuma caldera I'm outlining here with this double barb on the uh, dashed line here, that's the Montezuma caldera. And then we go up to the Turkey Canyon caldera right here with this, this dash line, no barbs on that line. 
And then a single barb line called the Parker Canyon caldera, centered uh, around Parker Lake, if you've been over to that area. If you hike Parker Lake, you'll be hiking through the products of the, the caldera. So how do they define the geology? How do they define these crater walls? That's what I want to show you coming up. Well, the way you do that is you uh, invoke the idea of exotic blocks. So I'm going to talk about that concept. In the Huachucas, this is a geology map of the southern Huachucas. This is Ash Canyon right here, uh, where it hits the upper part of Ash Canyon in the mountains. This is the center part of this map. It goes down to Coronado Cave. This is the Coronado Memorial down in this area with Coronado Peak at the Star region and Montezuma Pass. So it's at this parking lot here, Montezuma Pass, where you see the Border Patrol observations point. One is looking, has his eyes to the uh, west and the other constantly has his eyes to the east. Uh, if you looked into this area from the parking lot, what you would see would be these areas are big brown splotches on the geologic map. They're not brown splotches on the surface. They're different kinds of rocks set in a gray rock called limestone. There's no other way, geologically speaking, to account for why these rocks are occurring in the other rocks, in these big blobs. Look at this one here. It's If you look at the scale down in the lower left, this is almost two miles long, a mile and a half at least. How do you explain that rock being in this rock? Well, the way it can be explained is this is an expression of the rim of the caldera. The rims are over steep and often landslide. And these are landslid rocks that are distributed in the Huachucas that are now interpreted as the caldera wall in this area. This area in here would be the caldera floor because of the nature of the, the rock that we see in the region. So I wanted you to know, and when we go on a field trip in the Huachucas in Southwest Wings in year 23, uh, I'll go to this parking lot and we'll look at these rocks. Uh, and as you drive up the canyon, you'll be, you'll be able to see them. Pressing on uh, now toward the end of the presentation, going to the extreme southeast corner of the border. So Douglas is off the left side of the screen down low on your computer screen off my slide here. But there's a highway called 80 that runs up from Douglas all the way up to Rodeo, New Mexico that runs right through this red ellipse. And for the most part, I've circled what is known as the Geronimo Volcanic Field or the San Bernardino Valley or the San Bernardino Volcanic Field also. And it's a series of uh, very recent eruptions back to 270,000 years ago. And there's 125 cinder cones. Now, I don't think you can count 125 in this shot because some of them are very small, but you'll have no trouble picking out the larger ones within this ellipse. I'll show you what a cinder cone is. And on this road, you can actually drive through one up in this area. The road, Highway 80, goes right through it. So you can see outcrops on both sides of what a cinder cone cutaway looks like. You don't have to even drive all the way up to Red Mountain, uh, southeast of the Grand Canyon, northwest of Flagstaff. What I want to focus on also in the last slide is Paramore Crater. It's a totally different type of uh, crater than these cinder cones. Let's look at what a cinder cone looks like. And if you thought a cinder cone was just a simple conical hill, it has a lot of features. We won't cover every one of these, but the first one to look at is the axis. Uh, the horizontal axis is showing that this cinder cone here is only expanding over about 1,500 meters. So we're talking, uh, you know, part, part of a mile. Some of the bigger ones can be uh, uh, certainly that big. Most of them are less than a mile in diameter. Some are just hundreds of feet in diameter. They only get to be a few hundred feet, a uh, few hundred meters in 300 yards, we'll say, in height. And then they have layer upon layer of cinders or lava, and then they have lava flows. But the lava doesn't come out the top like you conventionally think of composite volcanoes. Look what's happening here. The lava flows in this light base color are not able to get to the top. They blow out the sides. So there's commonly lava flows in the San Bernardino field that you see going on from miles away from this cinder cone as an example. So the whole area around the cinder cone is, uh, has debris and has what's called a tephra blanket. Tephra is simply the all-inclusive term of what comes out of a volcano. The, this is very fluid lava. 
if it flows, as you can see, it doesn't uh, blast out. It does explode out and throw volcanic bombs several hundred yards, quarter of a mile, something like that. So you can find lava on the flanks of a volcano or even farther out. And the last type of volcano that I'm going to show you is within that same volcanic field, the Geronimo field. We just showed you what a cinder, cinder cone looked like. It has no water really that involved with the eruption. It has very low mechanical energy. The energy is charted over here. You can see that we're going to get to a volcano called a tough ring that has a lot of energy on the par with a nuclear explosion. And it has to do with uh, magma coming up like any volcano, but it hits the groundwater level. And here's the groundwater level, which is down a ways from the surface, the regular surface of the, the earth. So it causes a uh, steam to flash. And when it does, it causes an explosion. So it blows out something called a tough ring. And I'll show you what the result is in Paramore Crater in the San Bernardino volcanic field. Now, if the water table is right up near the surface, it again blows up, but it makes a tough cone. I don't have examples of that in the San Bernardino field because the groundwater level is much lower. If the groundwater level is low enough, I'm trying to get right at the bottom of the screen here. Can't raise it up. Uh, this is the ocean, for instance and water erupts into the ocean, we get this uh, peculiar lava called pillow lava. It's, it's shaped uh, with uh, kidney beans in mind, the shape, and they might be a foot or two across and stack up upon each other when it erupts well under the sea. The highest energy then on this chart would be the phreatic or what's called a groundwater eruption. We call it a tough ring in terms of the landform that's created. Let's look at that now. Here's Paramore Crater within the San Bernardino volcanic field. You can see other cinder cones around it. All these big uh, little mountains are cinder cones. And then there's a, a, about a mile in diameter, I'd say maybe a little more, is Paramore Crater. This is on private property, gated entrance. You need permission to go on. But it's a beautiful hike to see this, this phreatic eruption. So remember, it's coming from magma that hits groundwater. And that's the phreatic zone, the water, the top of the water table. It blows up, flashes to steam. And what we get as a product on the sides, the flanks of the vent are juvenile magmatic particles that have been blown to smithereens. I think that's where I'm going to stop today. And what you're going to see here is a Kilauea crater in Hawaii. I don't like happy faces, but I thought this one was appropriate. These are ACMA, act, very active magma uh, areas within Kilauea Crater on the Big Island of Hawaii. So I wanted to thank you all for uh, joining us in the Southwest Wing Birding and Nature Festival. This is our 30th anniversary this week, centered in uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona. And I'm thanking my facilitator and host, uh, Mary, for making sure this all came off. So Mary, I'm going to Go one more slide, that's the field trip side. I'll leave that on the screen if, if you please. Thanks. Reminding everyone I'll meet you tomorrow to look at limestones, uh, some of the older rocks that we have in our county, starting at eight o'clock at uh, the Outback Steakhouse parking lot. Over to you guys. Thank you, Glenn, Thank that you. was wonderful. Oh my gosh, yeah. so detailed and intense. I, yeah, a lot to take in, but I, I know everybody enjoyed it a great deal. We do have a question from Bonnie Mays. Um, she asks, how do scientists know if volcanoes are likely to erupt and are there any warning signs? Well, as I was saying that you can kind of compare them to earthquakes and, and weather prediction. Weather prediction much better than earthquake prediction and earthquake and volcanic predictions are about the same. They use meters and it, it could be meters of all kinds. Uh, Tilt meters it can measure the tilt on the side of a volcano to see if it's in, if the magma below is incre increasing the tilt, the angle of tilt on the side of the volcano. You can take put sensors inside the crater when it's not erupting that sense for gas, for instance, and gas changes mean something to a volcanologist. 
uh, when they look through their uh, gas chromatograph and see changes in the types of gases coming out or the quantity of gases being admitted. So there are subtle indicators of activity, but in terms of being able to accurately predict it, uh, all they can do is warn people like they do with Mount St. Helens, clear the area, establish a red zone, a blue zone to, to evacuate on a moment's notice. But that was even blown out of proportion in terms of uh, the consideration for that because that was such a massive explosion with pyroclastic flows and huge mud flows. So prediction uh, is done via remote sensing devices. And you can bet the volcanoes like Mount St. Helens are metered like crazy by the United States Geological Survey out of their Cascade Volcano Observatory in Portland, Oregon, which you can visit, by the way. Mm, yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Bonnie, for your question. Mm -hmm. So I've got a question, Glenn. Uh, Mary and I here are sitting down at the bottom end of Ash Canyon, looking up towards Montezuma Pass. How safe are we? I mean, it's called Ash Canyon, so there must be something happening up there. <laughs> well, remember those calderas that I showed you, the uh, Montezuma caldera, yeah. the Turkey Canyon caldera, and the Parker Canyon caldera are all termed Jurassic calderas. That meant they happened 80 million years ago. So they're all extinct. There's no current volcanic hazard in the Huachuca Mountains. But in contrast, in Cochise County, out to our southeast, just a mere 270,000 years ago, out in uh, east of Douglas in the San Bernardino Valley, you had eruptions of those cinder cones. That's why they're so fresh looking on the landscape. You can see their forms. Whereas up in Ash Canyon, if I hiked you up into the mountains, we could only look at the lava byproducts of an exhumed caldera that we call a cauldron today behind Ash Canyon. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Well, I'm, I'm lucky enough. I occasionally go, go on trips on the expedition cruise trips. I've been cruise ships. I've been out to um, Vanuatu and uh, seen some of the active uh, volcanoes there. And Mary and I have actually sailed into a caldera in Antarctica, where oh. the side of, side of it's broken open. It's called Deception Island. You can sail ships inside, mm -hmm. and if you get off on the beach there at low tide, it steams. And if you go down just a couple of inches into the volcanic sand there, it is very hot. It's an amazing place. So it takes years for these uh, tens of thousands of years for these things to cool off once they've erupted near the surface. Mm. So yeah. that's what you were feeling was uh, still residual heat from the magma that created that volcano. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can actually, you actually go in and swim there. The water is not totally cold, but it's, it's just about bearable to to go in because of that, that, as you say, residual warmth at the surface. The premier volcano on Antarctica is Mount Erebus. Maybe you saw that uh, when you flew down there or passed no, by. We, we were too far away to see that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Good. Right. Well, thank you very much, Glenn, for a wonderful talk. We all know a lot more about volcanoes now. And uh, Glenn has up there on the screen for everyone looking the details of his field trip. Don't miss this opportunity. It's a great chance to get out and learn a lot more um, about the ancient seas, the fact that the, there were seas all around us here. And that's what we're walking on a lot of the areas here. It'd be a great chance to go out and find out. Yes, and just a friendly reminder, if you miss the start of the talk, we will have it recorded and it will be available on the Southwest Wings website very shortly. And if you'd like to tune in later today at 3 p.m., we will have Rick Wright giving the final talk in this series uh, during the, um, the festival. And that's going to be about a uh, Arizona birding library, the best books to have on your shelf if you want to know all about Arizona birds. So uh, come and listen to Rick at 3 p.m. Yes. And finally, um, we have Swarovski with us. Maybe you all know this, but just a quick reminder, they're down at San Pedro House with their big trailer. They have all the most amazing optical equipment available for, for trying out. And if you want to, you can actually borrow a pair to use in the field tomorrow. As long as you bring them back, they'll take a copy of your driving license to make sure that you do. So Swarovski <laughs> down at San Pedro House from 9.30 to 4.30 today and tomorrow as well. Yeah. So pop down there if you can. Go ahead and visit them. And again, thank you so much, Glenn, uh, for your wonderful presentation. And thanks to everyone for attending today. Um, I guess that's about it for now. So uh, it's goodbye from me and Goodbye from Chris. Goodbye.
See you soon. Thank you, Glenn.